Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of The Conversation. Uh, we're back again, and uh, like we always do, uh, this is just another simple platform where we invite Gambians to come and um, you know, introduce themselves um, so that um, the people that are in the struggle and the Gambian people can get to know uh, these people that are fight, fighting to restore democracy in our country, where they stand on uh, national issues, and hopefully and uh, speak to the opposition that are fighting with us, and even the government, uh, to understand what the Gambian people have come to expect of them um, um, of late. This morning, we have a young man, uh, someone uh, very well known in our fight, um, and um, all the way out of Alaska, we have Mr. Ablai Lowe. Uh, Mr. Lowe, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And, and obviously, you know, people know you are different, different names. You're the imam, the, 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 <laughs> uh, you have all kinds of titles, uh, but your full name is Mr. Abdullah Lowe. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Good, good. Thank you, Mr. Lowe, again, uh, for taking the time off. I know that uh, you're a very busy man, but we're going to try and make this uh, a short session here. Uh, like I always do, uh, Mr. Lowe, I always like for people to introduce themselves. Um, to that person that um, hopefully hasn't known you, just a short self-introduction of who is Mr. Abla Lo that we always hear on these mediums and also on social media. Well, my name is Abdul Lo, and I was born in Banjul. Uh, I spent my early years in Bansang, you know, where I uh, met so many great people, and I, you know, had the opportunity to learn a lot from the community that I grew up in. Uh, when I sat to the common entrance and passed, I moved from Bansang and went back to Banjul to attend St. Augustine's High School. So after St. Augustine's High School, I spent two years at ICE for my uh, A-levels. And after that, I briefly worked. The only time I worked in the game there was uh, during the, um, the election. And the 2000, uh, the 96 election um, and the referendum, those, those were the only times that I um, actually worked in the Gambia. So I moved to the US, United States in 2000, and I have been living in Alaska since then. In Alaska, I, you know, have been involved in the community as a social organizer, community organizer. I was the second president of the Senate Gambian Association in Alaska. And I, you know, I'm a family man. I'm married with um, four children. I work, currently work for the state of Alaska um, as a psychiatric nurse. So, and I work, uh, my second job that I enjoy doing is I'm a counselor for adolescents, um, you know, delinquent adolescents, which is really an interesting job. So that's, that's about it. About it. Great, great. That's, that's, that's a really good. Um, obviously, I know that uh, the Bantam background I was very interested in. I saw that you had uh, flown to um, New York during the Bantam fundraiser. And so, I mean, you, you were born in Banjul and then you went to Bantam. Was it, were, were your parents in postings there, or are you one of those kids that, uh, that was too strong headed for Banjul? They had to send you to the <laughs> Well, yeah. Um, well, my dad died when I was uh, three years old. So I started really being, um, you know, you know, just really stubborn and doing stuff, doing crazy stuff. So my mom determined that it would be a great thing for me to just go to Bansang and spend time with my grandma who was living there at the time. So I went over there. It was just maybe for a few years. But then I went in there, I settled down. Um, and Bansang became my uh, new home. So I was used to, um, I was, in love with the environment, with the, with the, with the community. Uh, back then, we have a close-knit community where everybody is, just knows everybody, everybody's kind of related. We were just so tight, you know, so I enjoyed it. And I've never even thought about even going back to Banjo until after I, I finished school. Um, I did my uh, common entrance and I passed, and then I really, uh, it was time for me to go back to Banjo. But that was an experience gave me um, another perspective of uh, life in the Gambia. I mean, you know, it, gave, it, it just opens up my, my, my mind and 
my eyes on how I see things differently because I had the opportunity to travel to, uh, to places around the, uh, the Bansang and I went to villages and stuff and I see how they live. So, and I believe um, as a community and as a, um, as a country, we can do much better for the people that work the hardest, in my opinion, those are the farmers. So, so that Bansang trip really changed my perspective in life and gave me a new worldview. You know, I see things different, and I think part of my Bansang trip uh, taught me how to see, to stand up against injustice and just hate any kind of um, you know oppression or injustice of any kind um, because of that trip. So I'm really grateful that I took that uh, that, that trip to Bansang. Okay. Great, great. Uh, it's it's good that you you really experienced the good life in the Gambia, which is the uh, in the provinces, that's, that's really where it all happens. And, um, you know, in most cases, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people will be surprised to, 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 to hear your connections with Bantang. It was something that uh, I had interest in, um, just giving your connection with it. But you said that you, you live in Alaska right now. You were the second president of the Alaskan organization. Can you just tell us a little bit about the governments in Alaska there, your community, the feel? Um, to that person who is maybe thinking about coming to Alaska to 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 um, you know move over there, how how is the community there? And um, share a little bit. Well, about well, the the truth is um, the uh, the Senegambian community here, the Gambian community here, like uh, it is everywhere. Um, you know, we have our shortcomings, but we we tend to come together, um, you know, and just um, support each other when needed. You know, what I mean, um, I have seen. It's, it's, it's not a big community. It's this really small community um, of the adults who will probably just uh, less than 200. They're over 100, less than 200. So I kind of pretty much know everybody, except for those that have recently moved. But um, during my time uh, as president, I get to know everybody. And uh, we come together every time that the need arises. You know what I mean? So I have... You know, in the small community of over 100, there was a time we, uh, one of our community members was in immigration custody and we have to raise money to bail him out. So in a, in a, in a place of over 100 people, we raised $10,000 within 24, I mean, 48 hours. So it shows how generous Gambians can be, you know what I mean, and uh, how we come out and support each other in times of need. Um, that's something that connected me to this community, um, and that's why I stayed here for so long, because we were so close. We were a close-knit community, um, and I enjoyed my time here. Good. So if you are there and you are thinking about coming to Alaska, you are welcome. It's a great, great place to be. Um, you know, uh, the economy is good. Uh, people help each other out, and there are um, many opportunities that you can take advantage of. Thank you, Mr. Law. I am, I am confident you will not find anybody from Basse living in Alaska. It's a little too cold for us over there. We have uh, Bassians like, like that hot sun, I'm sure, which, mm-hmm. some of which you've experienced in, um, uh, in, 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 in Bantang. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, Bantang is also you know, one of those places that heats up quite a bit. But, uh, Mr. Yeah. Law, the reason I had you um, invited here at the conversation was because you're um, you know, um, part of the youth acti- activism that we see online. You're part mm-hmm. of the youth, not by age, just because by you know, following. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, and, and that's one of the reasons why I invited you here. Just wanted you to give us a pulse on you know, the youths. Like recently, we've just seen you know, yesterday, you know, some youths just got up in the Gambia and, and started demonstrating for, for their rights. If, if, if you were to give us a pause of, of what are the youths stand and position on the fight that we're involved in right now? Well, I would think that a lot of the youths, um, especially those living in Gambia, are pretty much indifferent. They were just like, they kind of, they are not interested in, you know, what we're doing. And part of it is that I, I like to say there's a disconnect between um, those fighting to liberate them, especially those in the struggle, and those on the ground. So we have a disconnect. 
and because uh, because of that, what I think we should be we should work towards is to uh, bridge um, the disconnect, you know, the, the gap between us, because we are kind of on different wavelengths. So, and part of it is uh, because. Well, the youth back home don't really, are really sticky. They're yearning for that leadership. They, 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 they want to do something, but they, there's no leadership. So they are kind of, everybody's just standing um, on their own, just waiting for somebody to take the lead. Um, and for us, we, the message, I think the message we are, we are sending, sometimes it's not as effective as it should be. In my opinion, we have to uh, work on changing the narrative, okay? We want to make it about them. It's about it. It's actually about them. It's not about us because we are here. We are really comfortable. Most of us, most of us are really comfortable around here. We have our family. Some of us are not even thinking about going home. But why we are doing this? Because we believe deep inside that the Gambian people deserve better. They, they deserve good leadership. They deserve a better country um, to call home. So all we are doing, we're doing it for them. But they don't see it like that. Most of them think that we are doing this because we are seeking, you know, leadership position in a future game year, which is uh, far from the truth. Because most of us are really comfortable here. And we're not even thinking about going home. You know what I mean? But yeah. now bridging the gap whereby they understand that we are on their side and we are in this together is very, very crucial. So how we do it is that's the tough job. But yeah. I think we are, do, we are working really hard and sending a message across. And even though <coughs> excuse me, they don't usually acknowledge it, but the message is going, um, is getting into them. It's going across. Every now and then you hear, I get uh, inboxes from youths telling us that, you know, they understand everything we're saying and they're with us. But the only problem with, with, it, with them over there is that they are all waiting for that leader, somebody who will stand in front of them. And yesterday, the events of yesterday, is very very is I welcomed it I welcome it a lot because we are seeing a new uh, we've seen things done in a different way we are seeing defiance you know and without that kind of defiance nothing's gonna happen now Mr Lowe, given that we've seen this defiance there that happened yesterday what mm -hmm. what what do you think needs to be done? to continue to empower them and also continue to agitate that, that, that activism that we've seen there. What, what do you think in your position should be the way forward right now, given what happened yesterday and what's happening today, um, to, 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 to really get the ball rolling? Because we know Yai is out of the country. The last thing you want is for this guy to come back into the country, because once he comes back, we know exactly what's going to happen. What do you think is the way forward moving on right now? Well, my thing is, uh, what, what I think we should be doing is to just keep sending the message, and um, we expect that people on the ground will stand up for these guys because they will stand it up for something that is going to benefit all Gambians, okay? Uh, we all know that we need electoral reforms. They took the risk and went out there, put themselves a, uh, in uh, a vulnerable position. We all know what could have happened, okay? So if we stay home, if, if we stay home and just watch them go through this, um, you know, who knows what's, gonna, what's happening there right now. While they're in custody, what they're doing to them, we don't know. So if we just sit at home and let them go through their ordeal, and then when they come out, you think they will do anything else like that? No, I doubt it. So we need to show our support to them. Right now, we need to uh, we need to send this message uh, across the board that we are with them, we support them, because no matter what, they are Gambians and they have the right to go out on the streets and protest any law that is unlawful. 
in that country. It's their right to peacefully assemble and protest against illegal laws. So that's you, their right. Just, just, just to continue to show them that what they're doing is the right thing. It's not. Uh, they more like continue just, just, just to, 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 to create that conversation so that they can well, well, understand that the people are with them. Yeah, yeah. So we have to show our support. We have to strongly show them that we are with them in every way possible. Uh, we are with them. We, our prayers are with them. We are support. And in financially and everything, we have to show our support, our unyielding support. And once we do that, we have to be careful, though, how we go out there and, uh, and send a message because we need to understand that we cannot liberate Gambians unless they are ready. Because, you know, but then this getting to get them ready, we have to be engaged in a lot of education, enlightenment, empowerment, and dialogue. We have to create, we have to be in dialogue with the youth in the Gambia. And if you think that they are not following what we do, you are mistaken. They know what we do. They know our stance. They know that we are fighting for them, and they know what is right. They know that the government of Yahya Jame has failed all Gambians, and he needs to go. So now when we send this message, we need to be careful not to chastise them, because I have seen posts whereby people, you know, calling them like, it's not force for them to be on the street. No. But our message should be simple but coherent. We need to tell them that, you know what, it's your country, okay? Instead of taking the risk, going through the back way to Europe, you can go over there and stand up for your rights and, um, and you know, kick your argument out basically. Go out there and do whatever it takes to get rid of Yagan because he is our problem. You know what I mean? Yes. Now, 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 now you, you touched on something a little bit that I just wanted to get back to, um, Mr. Lowe. Um, you touched on the fact that the people on the ground are with this notion that those in the diaspora are only in this fight or most are in this fight to go back and get their positions back home. Obviously, that creates that little... Uh, you know, uh, conflict of interest that we, we continue to hear on the airwaves. How do you think mm -hmm. we can diffuse that? Because just because I'm in a fight, you're in a fight, what, how can I diffuse for somebody to think, to, to, to think that, listen, I am not in this for personal gain because we're very comfortable here, like you're saying. And, and, and the fact remains that many of us that are here right now, even if there is change, we're not be moving back to the Gambia because we have our kids here, we have our families here. How do we carry on that conversation for them to understand that this is all about you? Be, even after saying this is about you, what other things can we do to show the youths that you're in, in, in touch with to understand this? Well, that's kind of where the disconnect happens. And, um, and I think it's, it's going to depend on the message, you know, how we portray the message or how we send the message to them is very, very important. Okay? Um, for instance, <coughs> excuse me, I, for me, my case is when I talk to them, you know, they know that I have children in the Gambia who are American citizens. They can come back anytime they want. You know what I mean? I have a, a mom in the Gambia who can come here and, and visit in times you want. You know what I mean? So I can live anywhere I want. I can, um, I can go to Gambia when change happens. And we, we, the, the thing about it is that my fight for Gambia is not a, to send a message to, to, to make them understand that this is not about me. For me, there are people who fought for me, where I'm living here in America, there are people who sacrifice their life so that um, I can live and enjoy the freedom of this country, that this country offers. So Gambians, too, have to fight for themselves. Now, we are not there right now, okay? We are here. All we can do is to educate them, to um, engage them, and make them realize that they are the ones that are responsible 
right now. It's their responsibility because they are the ones on the ground. We went, we got out, okay? But for them, they're still stuck in there. And then it's their choice, not us. Not, we cannot make them do anything. It's their choice to end this, um, the poor governance that Yajam is doing, the injustice that's going on in the Gambia. They can choose to stop it or they can leave to it and just go through this kind of injustice uh, for h- however long they want to keep doing it. So if, if we, we want to make it about them. It's their decision whenever they're ready, okay? But we cannot be standing here and, you know, asking them, uh, go out on the streets or whatever. Yes, some people are doing it. Maybe it's effective. Maybe it's going to take. But I will, I will see anybody who said, I'm here because somebody told me to be here. They will say, I'm here because I want to be here. You know what I mean? So we want to make it their choice. We don't want to make, uh, make it sound like we are pushing them to, put the, uh, to go out on the street. Okay? We want to tell, hey, it's your country. Right now, we are not there. Some of us here are very comfortable. The American citizens, they don't even need to come back to the Gambia. But your, this is your Gambia and your country to change. Very, very, very good point. To make sure that the message is clear that this is more about you guys that are there in that situation because we've got our, our, our freedom over here. Now, Mr. Lowe, you've got a group of youths in front of you. Educate them the need for them to come out there and talk and let their voices heard. They're all ears. Talk to them of the importance and the reasons why they should be an activist like you. Well, first I have to tell them um, why I chose to do this, why I'm in the struggle. You know, and it goes like this. I'm in the struggle to end dictatorship and restore democracy and respect for the rule of law in the Gambia. Everybody is not a, is not a secret anymore that we live in a, there's a dictatorship in the Gambia. Therefore, it's our collective responsibility as citizens and our moral obligation to end it right now. We cannot let one person run our life, especially someone as erratic and arrogant as President Jammer. So we need to understand that nobody, we are in this alone. The world is watching us to do something. We will get help, but we have to make the move first. If we do not make, if we have to agitate change, this is what it is. People themselves agitate change. They stand up and say, this is enough. We have to make the change. But unless they do something, nobody else, nobody out there will come and support them. So we need to tell them, they need to understand, you guys need to understand that. You cannot liberate yourselves alone. It's never happened in history where the oppressed get up and, uh, and liberate themselves by their own efforts alone. No. It's never happened. There's always an outside help. We are here to provide that outside help. We will do whatever, whatever it takes. If it's education, if it's financial support, whatever we can to facilitate this change, we will do it. So they need to understand that we are in the struggle because All that evil needs to triumph is for good people to do nothing. We have all witnessed the injustice and the wrongdoings that are going on in the Gambia. We all know about it. How people get arrested in the middle of the night from their families, taken away to an undisclosed location and keep them there for months and months, away from their families. The agony, what you know what I mean? The pain and suffering the family goes through is not right. And we cannot look the other way while innocent Gambians languish in jail without a free and fair trial. As we speak right now, Alaji Abdullah Sise is in custody for months. 
human beings, as human beings, we cannot sit there and do nothing because that's not the right thing to do. Personally, my yes, conscience would, would allow me to ignore the pride of my fellow Gambia. What, you were going to say something? So I, I, I said, you're right. It's a moral responsibility for every citizen to make sure that we protect one another, which is something that you, 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 you're really talking about. Now, with what you just said here, I, I know that um, you know, just uh, today we've seen Coach do a live um, video on, on, on Facebook. Um, is, is that working for you? Is that a way that um, you, you, you're looking at reaching out to the people? I know you've done a lot of videos that are very popular on, on Facebook. It seems like you are able to reach to a lot of people. Um, are, you, are, are you doing this to, 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 to reach? And, and what advice do you have uh, for the other activ activists that are in the struggle to do the, the type of videos that you're doing? Well, we, yes. Um, I am doing it to reach out to Gambians. Uh, to connect with them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The, the, the reality is, um, underground, we all know that there is no press freedom. The IGM is shut down every medium that is in Gambia for Gambians to stay connected, to stay abreast with what's going on in their country. But then we have other, other outlets, other means like Facebook. So why does we take advantage of it? You see, I go to Facebook. I do not even see all the negative stuff that is going on Facebook. I don't see it because I do not go on my news feed. No. I follow certain people. Everything they post, I get notification, and I go and read because I know that there's always benefit in whatever they do. So Facebook can be used as a medium to reach out to Gambians to connect with them, to deliver a message. See, and this is, you know, the 21st century. And there are so many different ways that we can send a message across. And doing a video is very, very effective. i tell you what, from my experience, I know that a lot of Gambians <laughs> don't like to read. You know what I mean? They read just, they skim through it. They, they read, but they just skim through it. Sometimes they miss the main point, the moral of the story. But if you make a video, a lot of people will take the time. Sometimes maybe they, they're just looking for something to do, and they just click on it. And if it's interesting, they will stay and listen. So, yes, this, this video is a, a way of reaching out to people that... Uh, don't like to read, like myself, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and that's why I do it, and to reach out to more uh, people. That's true. That's, now, you, you, you did mention that obviously gamers don't like to read, which is, which is part of the reasons why um, you, you decide to do these videos. And, and, and I, have to, I have to agree with you. It, it is clearly, clearly, clearly um, working, and uh, because people do listen to these things, and, and, and the more because all these demonstrations that we're seeing is a product of all this conversation that we, we, we carry on and, and, and continue to educate our people because we know that they're more in a bubble over there. They don't get the necessary information. And you talked about the need to really, you know, come out there and, and explain to them that this fight is more for them. Now, as, 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 as a youth, what, other than just social media, are you a part of a, of, of, of a group that is working to, to um, in, you know, help free our nation? Are you part of any group or are you just doing this, um, you know, by yourself just, just, just to see? Because I'm, I'm just trying to understand how and, and, and why this, this, this fight is taking for so long. Is it because we're not doing it in groups or is it because we're doing it individually? In <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> that is why. The reason why we are not getting where we want to get um, so fast is because we are doing this individually. Most of us are doing this individually. Um, I have been part of a lot of groups in, uh, in the past, but then we tend to go strong for months and sometimes even a year. And all of a sudden, you know, 
it dies down for whatever reason. Um, and some part of the part of why you know Gambian organizations and groups do not uh, last long is because when we disagree on issues, we make it personal. Okay, if somebody keeps disagreeing with you, people eventually take like he doesn't like me. But that's far from the case. For me, I can be in a group without even liking anybody there. But I am coming there to seek a common ground. We are there. When you form a group, you're doing it for a purpose. You have a goal to accomplish. So once you create that, once you decide that this is what you want to accomplish, everybody should be doing whatever they can to help the group or the team accomplish their goal. So our personal stuff, we should put on the side. Our personal uh, differences, we put on the side. But that is really hard for Gambians. I do not understand why. You know, people, when they're dissatisfied, when they're dissatisfied with whatever is going on, they end up going and boycotting the, the group. No matter how um, secret the goal of the group or the organization is, when they are dissatisfied, when they are mad or angry, they leave and they take people with them. You know what I mean? Or they try to, um, you know, break the group, which is really, really sad. Now, now Mr. Lowe, looking at the flip side, could it be that maybe we're really not just, um, you know, angry or, or selfish people that are hard to work with, that we, we probably j- just don't have any experience in this type of fight because the Gambian man, is, uh, the Gambian person is just a very humble individual. Could, could, all this, uh, could, could the length of this fight be connected to the fact that maybe it's not because we disagree too much, but because we just don't have the experience. And now that we're getting a little bit more experience, we're actually doing... Uh, uh, a lot better, and, and Yaya is seem to be cornered. Could, could it be related to that? Because sometimes I fear that this this whole <coughs> we're so negative, we don't get along. Um, obviously, it's there, but could it? Could you think the inexperience also has something to do with it? Because looking at yourself, you would agree. I'm sure you have gotten better at this fight and and, and in streaming your message. Well, um, I tell you what, though, if it's because we are inexperienced. Then how come we don't we still are fighting or working so hard to form a coalition? They've been there. They've been trying this for for a long time, and it's a no-brainer on that to get rid of Yahya Jame. They need to form a united front against Yahya Jame. Okay. So, but they're still having difficulties doing it. Okay. Um, the problem is the thing about it is that you know I do not even see our kind of disunity. I, I, want, uh, I, I do not see that as, as I do not see us coming together as being a big problem. Personally, I don't think it's a big problem. As long as we are all going towards the same direction, we all have the same goals and ambitions. We are all fighting for the same thing. We are good. But what, all, what we need to do is that we need to, be, uh, we need to collaborate with other groups. Like this incident that's going on back home, uh, Duga should um, do whatever it takes to support them. Right? And we're doing that, which is great. So we, we can have 10 groups or 20 groups. It doesn't really matter. As long as when one group is touched, we know that this is about um, our fight against injustice. Everybody comes together and give them a hand and support them. That's how it was here in the, in the 60s when they were fighting um, uh, uh, for civil rights. There were so many groups. Mm-hmm. They, but when, when there is a, um, uh, a protest, they come out and support. Mm-hmm. They come out and support and join forces and make, uh, you know, make, make, because unity is strength. And the more you, uh, all of all of them, they're more or more dollar. You know what I mean? When you have more people come together, stand together, they are, it's so hard to break them. You know, they're going to overwhelm the security forces. 
if they come out in their numbers. Definitely. I, th- I think the number issue and obviously the unity, the, 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 the single uh, voice and the single message is, is, is part of a problem. But Mr. Lowe, if you look at all these problems that we've discussed, um, how to bring the, 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 the youth together, how to st- streamline our message, how to bridge that gap uh, with the uh, folks back home, it's all about some of the issues that are really, um, you know, that Yair Jammeh has really taken up on. And one of, one of which I wanted to talk about right now is the religious issue. The Islamic State of the Gambia. You're a young guy. People know you. You're very outgoing, very social, but also you're very connected to your religion, and you, you've got the title of the Imam. As a youth, mm-hmm. as someone who is socially aware, what is your take on this? And how talk to that youth and let them know how dangerous turning our nation into an Islamic state is. And do you agree with it, first of all? I mean, obviously, you're all connected religious-wise. Is this something that you agree with? Do you think it's good for the Gambia, or do you think it's against the Constitution and it should not be implemented? I I disagree with it 100%. I do not think the Gambia should be an Islamic state Um, for various reasons, okay? We need to uh, understand, we look at the history of Islamic states. Uh, we look at we look at places that have been adopting it for so long. Most of them, most of them that are that whose economy is still vibrant, is uh, those t- that, those countries that have oil. Okay, um, if you look at Afghanistan, no natural resources. Look where they are. They're at the bottom of everything in the world. So we can. Religion, I believe, should be a personal thing, okay? You choose your religion, and you stay, um, you know, you stay true to your God and do whatever you need to do to fulfill your duties towards your God. But when it comes to a government and sustenance, it is very, very important that we do things based on sound economic principles. We came, we've been, you know, believers for, for the longest time, okay? That's, you know, how, look at Gambia right now. Everywhere you look, everybody's corrupt. And 90% of, of, of the citizens are Muslims. What kind of, what kind of, what kind of believers are we? where we worship God five times a day. You go to the office when it's, when it's time for prayer, everybody goes out and pray. But then that will not stop them from taking bribes uh, an hour later. So, you know, we cannot play with God. We cannot use religion only when it favors us and put it aside when it doesn't favor us. It doesn't favor us. Yeah, we cannot be doing that. But now, the, as, 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 as a young, uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you go, there. Where, where, where you going? On? Go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. Uh, as, as, as a young Muslim man, um, mm-hmm. I've, I've heard a lot of people saying that you know what, the the Christian community is very quiet about this issue, and they should not be. Do you agree with that? And do you think that? Uh, the, the, the Christian community needs to come out fighting? Well, the Christian community um, needs to, they, yeah, they need to come out and speak up and make, um, you know, make their concerns open to the public. They, they need to come out and tell, you know, the war that they do not agree with this because it is a very, very risky venture and we don't know how far we are going with this. And if you think, if you think Yahya Jame is brutal, wait until we have an Islamic state, a uh, Sharia law imposed on Gambians. Mm-hmm. You think, uh, you know, taking them in the middle of the night, killing them, the killings are going to happen at Magadi Square in front of everybody. So yeah. if we sit here and do nothing and wait until he imposes Sharia on us. We see what's been happening in Afghanistan. 
stadiums turn if they turn stadiums into into you know uh, you know places clean fields yeah firing squad taking people there killing them so and what what happened soccer you know you know even Afghanistan they can't even play soccer they suck in almost everything but you know that's the thing and I've been saying this for a long for a long time if you take oil out of Saudi Arabia Kuwait and all those places many of these places except for Dubai in 10 years they will be destitute because they don't work it's not, the, the economy is not based on hard work like America or the place or creativity or innovativeness. No. They just sell oil and they get the money and buy things. That's what they do. And we don't have those kind of resources. So if we adopt that, the, the, uh, their way of doing things, we are going to, we're going to, in 10 years, we'll be worse. We'll be one of the, you know, we'll be at the bottom of everything in the world. The economy, true. everything. It, yeah, I, you know, I, I never looked at it from that angle where, where you say all, all they do over there is just sell oil because the innovation, everything they come to the U.S. and pretty much, you know, get it. I mean, they have the wealth, and and, and I think that that is what attracts everybody over there. Obviously, you know, most of the um, you know workers over there are, are, are foreign workers. But that's that's a very good angle to take a look at it. Now that we we we, we know where you stand with this. Why, why do you think, as, as a smart young man, why do you think Yahya Jammed is trying to make us an Islamic Republic? <laughs> well, if I, I think that's, that's, you know, I think I, I have to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist to know what's going on in the head of Yahya Jammed. But what I believe, what Yahya Jammed has been doing for the longest time, um, Yaya Jame plays this game called distraction and attention seeking. And when the world is not paying attention to him, he has to come up with something radical. You know, we've seen how he came up and said he can kill AIDS and then he can kill cancer. And nobody heard anything about that anymore. He's not even talking about it. You know what I mean? Because he wanted attention. He wanted to say, hey, I'm here. You know what I mean? So I believe this Islamic, whole, whole Islamic state, he's, a, he's playing, he, he's a chess player too. He's, he's looking for something. He gets the attention, and then he's going um, to, he's going to go to, you know, the EU and all those places that stop giving him money to say, okay, you know, if you want me to, uh, you know, take a step back, you have to give me the money. So he's lobbying the Arab, Arab, Arab countries, in my opinion. What, what I think he's doing is to, to ponder to the uh, Arab states to get money out of them. Uh-huh. Okay. This is part of the, his, his scheme to get money elsewhere because he knows that it's not working. With the, he, create, he created enemies with the EU and all those places that have been so, uh, that have been um, very, very useful partners to the Gambia, helping us uh, in, in our economic development in, in, in a whole lot of areas, you know what I mean? So he created this uh, kind of, uh, you know, the fallout um, yeah. and just sit, uh, isolate himself to a point whereby he's not getting anything from them. Now he's uh, looking elsewhere. That's what I see. That's how I see it. You know, that's, 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 that's a great observation because each time, you know, he's, he's, he's cornered over there, you know, just like a little spoiled bride, you know, seeking attention all the time. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, sometimes these questions, we, we just pose them because we want the people to understand. And, and, and maybe, you know, this is where we're going to get these answers. Just, you know, hopefully we will find that person or, or that individual that, that was there when, when, when Yaya, you know, decided to do this and, 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 and just to clearly better understand the, 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 the sickness and, 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 and the type of incompetent leader that we have in that nation. But you live in the United States right now. It is getting to a point where it is probably almost easier to run a political party or start a political party or even run for president, for that matter, in this country than in the Gambia. If you were to go to the Gambia today, you probably, even if you qualify constitutionally to run, 
financially you will find yourself in a big challenge just to become a candidate, let alone, you know, um, you know finance a campaign there. The election reforms, where, where, where is your position on that? And, and, and what do you have to tell the people? Because there's a lot of, um, you know, noise out there, you know, to, to fight against these election reforms. I just want you to that youth base that you talk to and to the Gambian people uh, to, to, to share your position with us about these election reforms. <coughs> well, the reality is, um, Yair Gamez, uh, when, when he, you know, created those laws, those unjust laws, what he's essentially telling people or Gambians is that if you are poor, you can't be president in this country. And which, in my opinion, is really is not is against democratic ideals, because we have this as a president. You have to send a message to every Gambian, even the child, a five-year-old, who's aspiring to be president. You can look at him in the eye and say, if you work hard, play by the rules, you can be anybody you want in this country. You can be anything, even the president of this country. But now, if you change those laws and you know ask people to pay one million to register their candidates wow that is telling everybody that in order to be president in this country you have to be rich you have to have money or you have to have really wealthy sponsors and that what that is creating is it's going to be a breeding ground for corruption. See, you see somebody like Yaya Jame, who came to power without a penny in his pocket. And now he's one of, one of the richest uh, presidents in the world. If somebody puts one million to become president, what do you expect that person would do when they win uh, the presidency? Of course, they're going to enrich themselves even further because they, they spent one million. They took risk. It's a business investment for them. They took risk and put their money to run for president. So the first thing they do when they are elected is to recover their money and uh, maybe uh, an interest with it. Because, <laughs> hey, come on. People are not motivated by self interest. You're making a lot of sense because this is, this is probably, this is why I ask these questions. It's not because we don't know the answers. It's your mm. notion right now to say, listen, this is a no brainer because if you spend so much of your money to become something or to become the president, the first thing you're going to do when you get into that office is to pay yourself back because you've invested yeah. so much. And, and hopefully the people will understand the basic answers here is that by, 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 by the, some of these election reforms, and not only bad, but they, they, they're actually, you know, a breeding ground for, 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 for serious corruption. Because even, if, even as a councilman, if you mm -hmm. need to be a councilman in the game, or even a member of parliament, by the time you get into office, you're in debt, or you spend so much. And you, you will, you, the first thing you're going to try to do is obviously to, 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 to recoup everything that you put in instead of starting to work for the people, which is, which is what you're fighting for. But that's, that's, that's a really good take. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because you, you are going to enrich yourself. And if, if a country like America is the, the country, uh, you know, the, America, the, the, the American president is the most powerful uh, person in the world, if it costs zero, if it's going to cost you personally zero dollars to become president, you can go and run and declare candidacy um, and then start uh, fundraising. You can go all the way to becoming the president of the United States without spending a dime uh, from your pocket. If you can do that, why can't you do it in a country like Gambia? Why can't you go from nothing and become president? We cannot discriminate. We cannot discriminate, uh, you know, in, in any way. Because if you start discriminating based on uh, who has money to become president, we have an issue, we have a problem. You are making the poor, you know, you are just putting them in a corner whereby they will never get out of poverty. 
Well, you know, I mean, if if, if looking at the U.S., if 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 Obama were in the Gambia, he would not be president. And if if Yajame just needs to remember where he was before he became president, before he started, uh, you know, obviously, you know, having access to our finances. If, 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 if these laws were in place, he would not, as a citizen, be able to qualify because people knew that he was born poor, he was a poor individual, had nothing exactly. in his pocket. For, for, for him to come to that position just goes to show you the level of corruption. But, Mr. Um, uh, Pala, uh, thank you so much for coming to the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we're listening to uh, Mr. Pala Lowe here out of Alaska, uh, a, a fine young man in, in the struggle, very connected with the youth. Uh, what we're trying to do here, again, is to bring young um, Gambians to hopefully talk to one another, get to understand each other a lot better so that when we find ourselves at that table where we're making decisions, the process will be a lot easier because if we don't start the conversation right now, it will be very, very hard to start it later on. Just like we have seen with our political leaders right now on the ground, they're having a very, very hard time coming together and, 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 and formulating a plan that will hopefully um, you know, flush the dictatorship out, out of power. Palai, the biggest yes, concern and questions that many of us have, how we have political parties that are oppressed, that knows that individually they can never be elected into office as long as Yaya is there as individual parties. What is stopping from these leaders from coming together with everything else that they know to, to fight Yaya Jame as a unit group? In your take, You've done a little bit of psychology. That's that's part of your work. Help us understand. Well, see, <laughs> that's a million dollar question. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I think they are still in a position whereby they believe individually that they can, uh, since the item is so infamous now his popularity is really low at this point um they think especially um the udp who uh, we all know they are the you know they are the biggest opposition party in the gambia um they believe that they can beat yajame if there are electoral reforms but my thing is, I keep telling them this, why do you, would you sit there and think that Yaya Jame is going to accept electoral reforms? Knowing that, he's not, he, his popularity has gone below 50%. Knowing that, if he changes the law and, uh, uh, and accepts their electoral reforms, he has to win at least 50% of the votes he has to win the majority vote and at least 50% of the vote to avoid a uh, second round. So what they are really banking on is that if these electoral reforms uh, are approved by IEC, then they can go to first round of voting with the IAGAMI. And if he wins, as long as he doesn't win uh, 50, uh, over 50% of the votes, then we can have second round of voting. In, uh, and during the second round, they can come together, join, um, uh, you know, form a coalition, and then go against him the second time and beat him, like they did in Senegal. But my thing is, I know for a fact that Yaya Jami is not going to accept those electoral reforms. He's not going to accept it. Because Yaya is not, we think that he's not very smart, but Yaya knows exactly what he's doing. These reforms that he did last year, those laws, is geared towards discouraging the opposition, whereby they would uh, boycott election. And on election day, his people are just going to go over there and vote in their record numbers and give them an easy victory. And he's going to be there. And what are we going to do next? So my thing is, we know in the past that this has failed, okay? We cannot beat Yaya Jame. The best election that uh, the UDP did was in 96. That was their best year, okay? Um, the youths are not voting. Mm -hmm. And we know that the youths are not connecting 
with these leaders that we have right now. Except maybe if 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 any party right now has, um, I look at the the videos, I see the pictures, and I see a lot of women and older people in these opposition rallies. Most of the youths are not interested. So how do we get the youths involved again? That's what we need to focus on. But they know that individually they cannot beat the Ayajame. That's a fact. So they are banking on electoral reforms. I know, I have a feeling that they will come together and unite. That they will do. Because they know better. Come on. They know better. Um, But they are going to wait for those reforms which would never happen. My, if it was up to me, we come together right now, form a united party, and start campaigning right now. Go around the country and tell the whole world that we are united for change. We are ready to change um, the uh, Gambia, to change the government. And once we send that kind of message, and then we in, get the youths involved somehow, we got to find a way to get them involved. And once they are involved, yeah. it's over. It's done deal. Done deal. Mr. Law, we know that we're fighting for electoral reforms. And mm-hmm. part of it is obviously the, 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 the majority where you have to get 50 plus one in order to be the, the elected one. Mm-hmm. Do you think if electoral, uh, electoral reforms is done, do you think that this party single-handedly can still give you... To, don't you think the IA can still manage to pull at least 55% of the votes, given that he has all the machinery in his possession, he has all the money in his possession, because money wins elections? Oh, absolutely. I, I have no confidence in us going to um, elections individually, like all the opposition in this array, everybody in their own corner. I do, I do not have a single, even 1% confidence that we can beat Jame. As unpopular as he is, he is still going to get. He's still going to get. Um, I mean, if, if, if there are reforms, if there are reforms with the voter party that was going on, that use not vote, voting, they are, they are not interested, they are disengaged with what's going on in the country. And a lot of people just believe in that, hey, it's just a waste of time because we cannot beat him individually. So there's no, we are just wasting our time. But if we go there individually, what's going to happen is that other parties are going to take uh, a, few, a few percentage votes from the UDP and eventually they're just going to split the opposition vote. Mm-hmm. They're not going to beat him. They're not going to beat him. But if we come together and just form one party and send one coherent message to the people around the country that all we're doing is to change. We are doing this for change. We have a better chance. We have a better chance at beating the Ayajame when we are united. But when we are divided, we divide those opposition votes, we cannot beat him. And even if we beat him by one vote, we cannot get over 50% of the vote. We cannot. I doubt it. We, he, got, he got enormous resources. Yeah. How can you be that guy? I mean, money, money, money wins elections. He has this. I think even with the electoral reforms, I don't, I don't, I don't know if, 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 if you want to give him the legend of going to elections with him and giving him even an opportunity to, to, to beat you at the polls. But speaking of elections and, and electoral reforms, we have a new IEC boss in town. What is your take on that? What is your take on this whole new assistant becoming um, IEC boss? Do you see this guy really taking it as a task to even <laughs> engage your business reforms? Well, uh, well, the new IEC boss has been there. Um, he's just a product of the system. He's, an, uh, he's a member of the status quo. Nothing's going to change. I don't see anything changing. Um, I don't see him standing up against uh, Yaya Jame or doing um, the right thing uh, because he's been there for uh, 
for a while, and um, he knows how it is done. And you think yeah, is is is, is, is you know, it's not it's stupid? No. He he handpicked him, knowing that this guy can be uh manipulated and this is somebody that he can take advantage of. You know what I mean? Yeah is not crazy. Yeah doesn't want to leave the presidency. He's not looking for a way out. You know what I mean? So he's gonna put somebody there that's just gonna continue doing things. Uh, he's going to do business as usual. He's just going to do things the way they used to do the IEC. And that is everything is, is in favor of uh, Jame because Jame has the power to fire him anytime he wants. Mm-hmm. So how are, you, how are you going to stand up against somebody who can fire you anytime he wants? You can't. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, I asked that question because there has been a serious debate online. People saying, you know what, he's, he's not a new boss. He was not the boss before. We should give him an opportunity to really see what he's made of. But once you give him an opportunity, obviously he makes blunders. Then we're back to square one again and, and you know, just having to go through his record and, and, and see that this guy has never challenged his boss or has never come out and say anything contradictory to, you know, the way the I, 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 IEC was being run before. But, Bisolo, once again, like I said, I know that uh, you're a very busy man. I try not to, you know, take too much of your time. Thank you so much for coming to the conversation with us here. I always like to do this. I like to give people the opportunity. And I'm going to give you two opportunities. The first one, as a young Gambian who has been in this struggle for 21 years, you're very well settled in the United States. You can stay here forever. And chances are you're not going back home because your family's here, your kids are here. Even if you go back home, it's probably going to be a temporal um, situation because this is where your kids are. This is where we're going to be. That's just the fact that many of us are having a very hard time to accept. But you Mm -hmm. still have a lot of interest in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Talk to that opposition and let them understand why they need to come together. Mr. Lilo just talking to them and telling them, listen, this is what we want you to do. What do you want the opposition to do to help you get to freedom as you want it? Well, the opposition, needs, they need to understand that um, why we are in this fight. And um, this fight we are in is a fight that we chose to do. Uh, we we. We could have avoided all this. We could have been going to the Gambia in and out and not say anything like everybody else, okay? Um, but we decided not to do that. Why? Because we know that the Gambian people deserve better. They deserve, deserve better leadership. They deserve a government that will, um, that will represent the people. Uh, that government, we deserve a government that is transparent, a government that is accountable to the people, a government that delivers on her promises to the people. As we speak, inflation is off the roof. Unemployment is high. People are struggling, really struggling. There is lack of economic freedom. It's only one person that is controlling enormous resources. He's engaged in all kinds of businesses, which are all against the constitution of the Republic of Gambia. I'm not even going to go into the constitutional violations that goes on annually in that country. The people are suffering. Travel the, the, the length and breadth of this country and see how people are getting by. They're barely getting by. And not only that, but when they get sick, they go to a hospital without proper equipment, without the medications they need, and some of them will end up losing their lives. While they are going through that, while they are struggling, there is a man out there that spends over $84 million a year to celebrate holidays. He spends over $2 million 
dollars, two million dollars to celebrate July 22nd. You doing this when people get sick in the um, in the villages and town. There are no ambulances. They ride a donkey cart to go to the hospital to drive all the way to ride all the way to Bansa. When their wives are pregnant, they have to ride that to go to the hospital. When we know that we, we the Gambian people deserve more, the opposition needs to understand that this is not about them anymore. This is about the people, the Gambian people, who are suffering every day because we have a president who doesn't care about the welfare of the people. All he cares about is to stay in power a year uh, longer, another five years. That's all that matters to him. Everything he's doing, he's doing it to stay in power. He has no plan to leave power, no plans. He is not even looking forward to what he would do after his presidency. He's not even you know, working on his legacy. So now, in order to end this, the opposition need to understand that this is no longer about them. This is about that farmer in um, Fuladu who is doing everything in his power to contribute his quota to the national development and have a little to raise his family. This is not about um, the opposition anymore. It's about that, 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 um, that woman over there in Bacau who is cultivating all these vegetables and stuff that we eat. And still, when they get sick, they go to a hospital without medicine. And when they retire, they will not even get a social security check. So we need a government. We need to change this government and replace it with something that is better. You know, a government that would be governed based on democratic ideals, a government that respects the rule of law and the Gambian constitution, a country where every citizen is given equal opportunity to acquire economic goods. A Gambia where hard work is generously rewarded and those who excel in every aspect of human endeavor are honored and given what rightfully, rightfully belongs to them. Not a government that just takes advantage of the people. So this is not about them anymore. It's about the people. They need to get that and they need to understand this aspect. They need to know that we are in a, uh, at a crossroads and we need them to make the right decision for the betterment of all Gambians. And I believe they can do it. And I have confidence that they will do whatever it takes to get rid of Yahya Jame and replace him with a government that cares about the people. I have that confidence. Uh, sensible government indeed. Thank you so much, Mr. Lord. That was so well said. I, the, this question, I have come to learn that when I ask Gambians this question, they speak from the heart. And you can hear the passion, the, 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 the desire to, for, for, this, for these leaders to come together to free us, not, not, not only for us to go back home, but for us to be able to say once and for all that our nation is a free nation. We can go over there. And, and, and practice our, our, our civil rights and do whatever we, we want to do in our own country. You've spoken well to the leaders. The leaders, obviously, are the ones that are going to lead us into the Third Republic. But we know this is a fight for the youths. Because, believe it or not, the leaders are almost done. They're now heading towards retirement. It's all about the youths, the 18-year-olds, the 19, the 20-year-olds, 20, the 25s. Speak to that group of people also and show them that they have more to lose in this fight than the leaders, than those of us in the diaspora, that they also need to come out and get their voices heard because they have to lead this. Well, I don't understand why the youths would go over there and risk their lives 
by taking the back way to Europe. When they know that the problem, the cause of their troubles and their suffering is our inept leadership. See, we can run away from home, but the problem, the problems that Gambians are facing is not going to go away. If we all run away, the youth are the future leaders of that country. The future is on our hands. It is okay to leave the country to go pursue higher education with the intention of uh, coming back, or if you can't come back, just find a way to contribute your quota to national development, to help the Gambia be the kind of country that we will all be proud of. See, we need to understand that Gambia used to be a great place to live. When we were growing up, we didn't have much, but every family was able to get by. We were looking out for each other. There, were, uh, there was this sense of community in us. But all that is gone because we have a leader who thrives in creating disunity amongst the population. What he is good at is to create discord between families. We've seen how many families you fire um, the big brother and hire the, 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 the younger brother to replace him. You know, all these tactics, creating this distrust between Gambians, where people don't trust anybody anymore. We are all strangers to each other. This Gambia needs to, we need to change. We need to change to go back to where Gambia was. A Gambia where we all can be proud to call our own. A Gambia that will be respected internationally, whether it is in sports, intellectualism, or diplomacy. You know, a Gambia where we all can raise our hand and say, I am Gambian. But in order for that to happen, something must change. And Yaya Gami has been at the, um, our president for 22 years, almost 22 years. But we have seen that that country is not prospering. The country is not moving forward. In fact, we are moving, we are really uh, regressing. If you look at it, you know, look at inflation. Gambians, Gambia standing around the wall is, um, is at the bottom. We've never been this low in our nation's history. And not only that, but he's isolating us from the rest of the world. Even the countries with enormous resources cannot survive isolation. But who's going to suffer, though? Not Jame, not his family, no, not his wife. The people will suffer. The poor people who are struggling every day to make ends meet. Yagami owns a home in Potomac, uh, Maryland. Over $3 million. Yagami openly told Gambian that he would never be poor again. But then, everything he does, every decision he makes, he makes against, uh, uh, he makes it against the Gambian people, if you look at it. Because if you tell all our daughters, if you tell the EU to go to hell with their over half a billion annual aid, half a billion dollars if that comes to the Gambia, you tell them to go to hell with their money. Who's going to suffer? It's the people. And uh, everything that he's been, he's been bragging about 
the roads and everything was built by the money the EU was giving them. Which means our roads are going to get worse. They're going to get depleted. Our economy is going to get worse. The dollar alone has depreciated 75% compared to the so far, just since 1999. Senegal is, uh, so far used to be like nothing to us. But now it's appreciated in value compared to the dollar. 75%. Three times more. We are going down. This country is not going to go up again unless we change the leadership. And we know that. So what are we doing? We're going to sit there for outsiders to come change that? Now, if our country we have to do it ourselves. We need a country that is going to represent all its citizens, not just a few. Every Gambian should be given the chance to acquire economic goods, acquire wealth, and live free from any kind of injustice of fear. That's the Gambia we seek. Again, Gambia we all will be proud to call our own. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mm-hmm. Lowe. This is the essence of this conversation. This is the essence of what we're trying to do here. To let the people understand that those of us that are in this fight, we're just not fighting because we find ourselves in the United States of America. We're fighting because we truly believe that our nation is headed in the wrong direction. Like you say, we're at a crossroads, a crossroads of either freedom or tyranny, a crossroads of either a a, a peaceful end for our country or war, a crossroads of having its citizens either speak up and fight for freedom or be quiet and live in tyranny. And some some of us that chose to speak up let it be known that we're speaking up because we have for once tasted freedom. And this is this freedom that we want our people to taste, to understand what it is like to live in your country where you can get up, rise up anytime, demonstrate, speak your mind, or even speak against the leadership without having to be tortured, killed, or be thrown into jail. Thank you so much for coming to the conversation. Thank you for the time. I know you're a very busy man, and I know you're not feeling very well right now, but you did make the time to come. This is what it's about. This is what uh, fighting is about. This is what you say when you say dedication to something is about. When you are busy, when you put your family aside and you still find time. And this is how we're going to have to do to find time between our busy schedules to come together, create that needed conversation to hopefully, hopefully our people will hear the, 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 the concerns that we have and hopefully one day we will have a united voice, a united front that will kick the dictatorship out of our nation and we will get our country back. Thank you so much for coming to the conversation. If you have any closing words, um, go ahead and do so. But we'll definitely be sure to get you back when you're feeling really well and on, on any development. And the conversation is always open. If you have any issues you want to talk about, we will do that. We know that you're on social media all the time. You do your live videos. Those are really great. I, am a, uh, I did subscribe to them. And I encourage you, Mr. Lowe, I encourage you, and we have to do this to each other. Don't stop talking. Don't stop fighting. It is a responsibility, an ethical responsibility that every Gambian must do. Thank you so much. You close the well, conversation right now. Well, I, I am honored to be here. Um, it was a privilege, and I am really deeply honored I know that <laughs> the invitation is not based on, um, you know, who's the smartest or because if that's the case, then I won't be here. It's not because of who's the most educated. If not, I'll be, I won't be here. And if it was about who's more eloquent, then I wouldn't be here either. But I know I am here because of um, you who have confidence in me and invited me, and I am deeply honored. Uh, but the last words I'm going to tell the people is to remember one thing. Um, I know a lot of youths who are all, you know, 
he did this, he did this, he did that. My, I've always argued that presidents are not only judged by uh, the things they do, but also by their inactions. You know, we measure their achievements for doing, not for doing what they were supposed to do, but mostly for their failure to do the things that they were supposed to do, but they failed to do. You know, I believe that the responsibility of a, gov- a responsible government is to protect the lives, uh, properties, liberties, interests, and the general welfare of the people they govern. Is Yaya Jammer's government doing this? That's the question they need to ask themselves. And if he's not fulfilling his, his duties towards the Gambian people, why is he still in power? Why? That's what we need to ask ourselves. We, have known, we, we know that Yaya Jammer failed us, and we know that he is incapable of running a household, let alone a country. We need to do whatever we can to make sure that his uh, presidency ends in 2016. By December 2nd, we should have a new government in place, a government that will represent all Gambians. I thank you for your time. God bless you and God bless the Republic of Gambia. Thank you, my friend, and a good day from Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you.